evening, everybody. Thank you. So all of you have on your tables, there are agendas there, so you can see what's happening tonight. First, you'll see that Dr. Steingel will, will be speaking, and then Dr. Samowitz, a urologist, will speak as well. The urologist will be speaking about urologic dysfunction. He's not here to talk to you about your cognitive skills. Okay, he's here to talk about maybe voiding problems that you have or anything else to do with the urologic system. For those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I'm president and founder of MS Views and News. We started MS Views and News back in 2008 when we learned that there just wasn't enough information out there for people to find and where to find their information about multiple sclerosis. We started with a newsletter. That newsletter was just reaching the people in Miami at that time. It started to grow. Support group leaders around the state of Florida were asking for it, so that way they could give it to their groups. And that began to grow. Around the country, they began asking for it. Now, these days, since the early 2000s, our newsletter is now reaching people in more than 90 countries. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Aside from that, we have over 28,000 that are now registered with us. By the way, before I go further with all the chutzpah about MS Views and News, we'll just say that um, I want to say thank you to Genzyme, a Santa Fe company who gave us the grant to do tonight's program. It's very, very important that we gratify those that give us the dollars to do our programs, because otherwise we would not have it to be able to supply these programs to all of you. In addition to Genzyme, I want to thank Infinity Clinical Research, QuestCore, Teva, as they also gave dollars to do tonight's program. Of course, I want to thank our volunteers. My nephew's here tonight. He's doing something with us for the first time. He just needs his community service hours, so he's here. <laughs> all right. Other than that, you know, I want to thank all of you. Again, these programs would be nothing if you guys didn't show up. So I thank all of you for coming. <laughs> all right, to go a step further, this is our eighth program of the year already. We're only at the end of February. We did three in January. We, this is our fifth program in February. Okay, we have plenty to do in March and all the way through June. When the second week of June comes to a close, we'll have done 18 programs so far this year. Last year as a whole, we only did 31 programs. Last year we did 30 in the state of Florida. We had one, our first one, outside the state of Florida. Some of you know about it, others don't. This year, as part of that 18, three of them will be out of the state of Florida. The first one will be in Birmingham, Alabama in April. Then we're doing Charlotte, North Carolina in May and back to Atlanta again in June. The second half of the year, we hope to be in South Carolina, other portions of Georgia, and many other locations in the state of Florida as well. I'm done, now done with the education programs. April 6th, we're having our Bowlathon. It's our fourth annual Bowlathon. We would like you or your families to come on down. Why? Because the proceeds of this will benefit an MS stem cell research study. Okay? So we need people to come on down for this. It also benefit other MS education programs. Again, we ask you all, if you're able to come and bowl, great. If you can't bowl, but you can put the bowling ball down on top of a rail, it could scoot on down to the ground. Come with your family, come with your friends, just come on out and support the research that we are now supporting. If you want to know more about that, stay after the program, speak with Jill, she's the person that checked you in outside. Again, tonight we're having Dr. Steingo and Dr. Samowitz. Each are going to do their presentations. After their presentations, we're going to do Q&A. So please hold off on any questions until afterwards. Now, just so you know, again, these video cameras are not here to record any of you. They're only here to see the presenters, and possibly it'll pick up your voice. That's it. You will not be seen on the video. All right, so for anybody who's video shy or don't want the public to see them here, that's great. You won't be seen. So, though, if you have a question to ask, I'll be running around the room with a microphone, all right? And that's good for me because I need to lose a few pounds, all right? So just make sure that you have a lot of questions so I could lose maybe a pound and a half tonight. All right, that's it for right now. So, again, I want to uh, thank you all for coming out. And next up we have Dr. Harvey Samowitz, who's up from Aventure, I believe, to uh, come down and speak with you all about all this urologic mess. 
So my name is Dr. Harvey Samwitz. I'm a urologist uh, in Aventura and Pembroke Pines. Uh, I am uh, board certified in urology, but also in a new subspecialty of female pelvic medicine, voiding dysfunction in reconstructive surgery. And this is a new, uh, a new subspecialty in urology that focuses on voiding dysfunction in patients that are primarily in the female population because they were underserved, but also in patients that have neurological illnesses. And in fact, I just came from our annual meeting in Miami. I was just there all day. It's called SUFU, the Society of Eurodynamics and Female Urology. And I actually, through the miracle of modern technology, I took some pictures of some of the posters down at SUFU, and I then emailed them to myself um, from my iPhone, and then I put them on my slide deck. So I don't know if they came out. We'll see. We'll find out together, because I didn't even get a chance to read the poster, but I thought you'd like to see what's current and new. Um, so this talk actually is, is not really just geared for MS patients. There's going to be points of it that are specific to MS patients, but the reality is the problems that, that plague the, the, uh, the multiple sclerosis patient also uh, other patients, the general population, suffer from a great deal as well. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off talking about MS, but those of you that are not afflicted with this are going to hopefully benefit from this as well. Can you see around me? Am I getting in your way? Okay. So uh, frequency urgency is obviously a very significant problem for a lot of people and not being able to control their urine uh, when they want, going too often and having to be sort of tethered to a bathroom. Nocturia is when you have specifically nighttime frequency. So daytime frequency, we usually uh, use the cutoff of if it's, you're urinating more than seven times a day or three times at night, we consider that a bit much, okay? So that's sort of the arbitrary cutoff that was set up many years ago when they were doing research studies on the new drugs for overactive bladder and urinary frequency urgency, and, and we've used those numbers since, and they've kind of become ingrained. Incontinence, obviously, is the loss of urine uh, that's uh, uncontrolled. Uh, recurring urinary tract infections uh, is a problem, and then retention. Uh, other urinary issues that I'm going to touch on from, that are related to the multiple sclerosis patient in particular is if these problems go on to become renal failure, if they affect their kidneys. Uh, the problems associated with catheters, which are used for drainage. Uh, pelvic pain and burning with urination. Dysuria means the burning with urination. So even before the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is made, about 10% of, of those patients are initially presenting with urinary symptoms. And that's sometimes the first indication that they have MS, is their urinary symptoms are, the, the, are, are, are what is uh, showing up first before anything else. Um, up to 80% of MS patients will have urinary problems. So it's a very common issue for the MS patient. When you look at the general population, it's also a very common issue, but certainly uh, much more so in the group uh, here. Um, and then, of course, we take this seriously because the complications associated with the urological problems can go on to lead to serious mortality, morbidity and mortality. Um, this just is a uh, slide that I had that shows that uh, um, urinary symptoms uh, affect a great number of the population. 33 million Americans uh, suffer from overactive bladder. That's roughly a third of uh, men ages 30 to 70 have lost some bladder control. This translates to 25 million Americans. And as you can tell, this is a significant problem for the general population, not just the MS group. Uh, an overactive bladder is a term that was developed. It's based on symptoms alone. It's where you do urinate more than eight times in a 24-hour period or more than three times at night. That's the definition now of overactive bladder. It's based on the symptoms alone. We don't actually know in the case of most patients what causes overactive bladder. Overactive bladder is, is based on symptoms, not on pathology. Normally, we make diagnoses based on pathology, and this is one of the unusual cases. It's based on symptoms alone. It does increase with age. Uh, it's more common in women. 
Uh, it's more common in patients that have other illnesses, um, comorbidities. Uh, obesity and diabetes also are, are uh, increased risks for overactive bladder. So what is the process of urination? You know, it's something that we take for granted for the most part, but it's a fairly complex uh, situation. But we can break it down into some simple components, and that is the storage phase and the emptying phase, the elimination phase. Is that better? Am I? Okay. Uh, the storage phase quite simply means that you want to store urine, the bladder has to relax to be able to store the urine, and the pelvic floor and the sphincter contract to hold it in. During the voiding phase, the elimination phase, obviously the it's just the opposite. The bladder does the contraction, pushing the urine out, and the urethral sphincter and the pelvic floor have to relax and let the urine flow. So we try to break things down uh, in, in that way to try to simplify what is going on with the patient because it's not always clear. And so there's the storage uh, uh, problems, there's the emptying problems, and of course, to make things complicated, there's a combination. So voiding dysfunction in the multiple sclerosis patient, uh, there's a number of issues, and, and of course, there's some that are unique to them. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, move over that slide. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl going to the bathroom? Okay. So frequency and urgency. Um, Overactive bladder uh, can then become significant enough to lead to urge incontinence. Urge incontinence, obviously, is where you have a strong enough, uh, powerful urge. The bladder takes over, pushes the urine out before you get a chance to get there. But not all incontinence is, that, uh, is of that type. Not all incontinence is where the bladder is responsible for pushing the urine out. Uh, in some cases, you can have incomplete uh, bladder emptying that is leading to the, the frequency and urgency. What happens in these cases is that the patient leaves the bathroom, they're already still half, half full. So as a result, they urinate quite frequently because they're only topping off the bladder. They're not getting it all out. And that can happen for a number of reasons, which we'll get to. So urinary tension is where you can have either an underactive bladder, which means it doesn't contract well. Now this, I, I just revised this slide about a half hour ago because this term, underactive bladder, which makes perfect sense, is a brand new term that we're using now at our, uh, at our meeting. Uh, it used to be called uh, hypocontractility. Uh, uh, we had other names for it, but bottom line is it's where the bladder muscle loses its push. And an underactive bladder, there's some very, I'm just gonna go to the side right now. When this happens, when the bladder muscle loses its push, we traditionally didn't have very much to offer patients. And, and it was very exciting. They just gave a talk about stem cells. And they're now, they're doing a biopsy of a patient's thigh muscle. They're growing these cells in culture. And when they get to about 250 million cells, they inject them back into the bladder. And they had their first patient, and so far, they're, they're, it's looking very positive that their bladder muscle may regain its tone, its muscle tone. And they're going to probably be doing the same thing for patients that have the weak sphincter. And I'll, and I'll talk about that. It's just really amazing. Uh, Dr. Michael Chancellor, who uh, did most of his work in Pittsburgh, is now in, um, at Beaumont Hospital in Michigan. And it's just amazing, amazing uh, research that he's doing. He won an award at the meeting. Anyway, getting back to this. So the bladder is, loses its, its contractility, meaning that it's not able to push well enough to get all the urine out. And uh, you can sometimes have urinary tension because of a blockage. In men in particular, uh, it's the prostate. The prostate grows as we get older. It's a natural part of the aging process. It comes along with gray hair and wrinkles. Uh, it starts at about the age 35 in most men. And it's not noticeable till they're in their 50s. But the prostate continues to grow. This is not cancer. It's just a benign enlargement. God knows why God decided to do this because it doesn't really serve any function that way. But the prostate grows and it gets bigger and it blocks the flow of urine quite simply. Uh, there's also the possibility in men that they could have a scar develop in the urethra. That's the tube that carries the urine from the bladder to the outside through the penis. And that urethra could develop a scar. And that's called a urethral stricture. Now, fortunately, women don't develop any of these problems. They don't typically have bladder outlet obstruction, except when their sphincter muscle doesn't relax appropriately. 
But uh, in men, there is that, op that possibility when they have a, a problem with retention, we have to consider, is it due to blockage or is it due to a weak bladder? Uh, overflow incontinence is where the patient's bladder gets so full and they're unable to get it out, they're leaking urine just from the overflow. And uh, that's also from urinary retention. So specific to multiple sclerosis patients, there's a phenomenon called detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, DSD. And detrusor sphincter dyssynergia is where there's a lack of coordination between the bladder and the sphincter, the pelvic floor. That's where they want to empty, they want to, they want to void, and they can't do it well because even though the bladder's contracting, the pelvic floor and the sphincter are not relaxing. And, and there's sort of a fight going on, and because their bladder muscles tend to be on the weak side, the spasm that occurs in the pelvic floor and the sphincter doesn't allow them to void well. And that's an, a, a sort of a unique problem to the MS patients. It can happen in other neurological illnesses, but a good percentage of MS patients will have some degree of detr detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. And as a result of this, they can develop high residuals. And from the high residuals, they then have urinary frequency because when they leave the bathroom, they're still partially full. So when it comes to uh, the particular uh, the, the group of MS patients, the most common finding is the overactive bladder. Uh, the term I have here is detrusor hyperreflexia. That's technically the correct term, but for the, for the general population, for the for layman, I usually use overactive bladder because you can understand what I'm talking about. So that happens in about 90% of MS patients is the overactive bladder. And as you saw from that previous slide from the National Association for Continence, overactive bladder is extremely common in the general population. Again, about 17% of the general population have that. So about a third of the patients that have the overactive bladder will also have the detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, that, that, that unusual uh, uh, situation where the sphincter and the bladder don't talk to each other. And then bladder areflexia, uh, the new term we're using now is the underactive bladder, uh, occurs in about 20% of the MS patients. Uh, other complications that we have to look for is a stiff or non-elastic bladder from the chronic blockage or the chronic, uh, uh, it, whether it's from the, the sphincter not opening appropriately or it's from a prostate or whatever, bladders can get stiff. A normal bladder muscle should be very elastic. It should be able to stretch to an unbelievable size, quite frankly, to about a liter, and then it should be able to contract uh, easily, and it should be very elastic and, and not have a lot of change in pressure as it fills. But the reality is, over time, uh, some of the, uh, not just MS patients, but other patients too, will get stiff bladders. They lose their compliance. They, do, they, don't, they don't expand well, and as a result, they get replaced by scar, and they can't contract well either. Uh, because of the high post void residuals, some patients can develop urinary tract infection or bladder stones. And um, uh, the real concern from the high bladder pressures is that these pressures may then get transmitted up to their kidneys. And if that should happen, there's a risk for doing damage to the kidneys. The high pressures over a long period of time will, will damage the kidney function in the way it produces urine, and, and patients have the risk of going into renal failure. Or if they, are, if they get a urinary tract infection, the urine backs up to the kidney, the infected urine get, backs up to the kidney, they get a kidney infection, and that can get into their system, and, and that's very dangerous, a pyelonephritis. So we're very concerned about uh, patients that have neurological illnesses and, and how it affects their kidneys. Years ago, uh, the number one cause of death for spinal cord injured patients was uh, renal failure. And uh, it's no longer that way because we're very careful not to let that happen. Um, so part of the way that we work up a MS patient is we run a, a number of tests. Of course, we take a history, we examine the patient, uh, history is the most valuable part of what's going on with them. 
And then we also have the ability to run certain sophisticated testing. Uh, this is a uh, printout of what we call urodynamics. And what urodynamics is, is that we place a catheter in the bladder and we hook up the patient to a computer and we slowly fill them with water while they're hooked up to the computer, which is measuring different things at the same time. And we're trying to duplicate in a laboratory setting what is happening to them at home with their bladder filling with urine, but we're just using water in, the, in our office in our lab setting. So the, the urodynamics basically has different channels. I'm not going to expect you all to become junior urologists, but I just thought you'd like to get an idea of how we figure things out. So each of these, this is bladder pressure, this is abdominal pressure, this is calculated subtracting one from the other. So technically, if this is what's inside the bladder and this is what's inside the abdomen, if you subtract them, this is really the pressure that's contributed by the bladder muscle itself. So the computer automatically subtracts this from this and ends up here. Um, I'm not sure what that is. I think that's flow. That's, yes, yeah, that's the flow. So that's where if the patient actually voids, we capture that and we can see their flow rate. This is the volume that they put out. And this is the electrical activity of the pelvic floor. What is happening with this patient is they're, they're trying to urinate at this point. This is void. They're, this is the, all the filling phase. And then here's the voiding phase from here on. So filling and then voiding. So at this point here is where they're trying to empty. They're not getting a great stream going. And what is happening is this, this is the muscle of the pelvic floor. You'll notice this is quiet while they're filling. It's not doing much. Then when they try to void, all of a sudden the pelvic floor muscle starts going crazy and, and closes when it should be relaxing. It should stay even, it get even more quiet. Here it's starting to pick up pressure holding the urine in, but instead of going quiet during the voiding phase, it gets more active. So this is how we diagnose detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. And I just thought that would be somewhat interesting. There won't be any tests, don't worry. <clears throat> so how do we manage these patients? Well, you know, everything gets tailored to the individual, and it really, it really depends on what the problem is. We're, we're, our primary goal is, is, you know, of course, quality of life, adequate emptying of the bladder at low pressure. That, that is the number one goal. Get them to empty their bladder at low pressures, put them at low risk for any damage to their kidneys, put them at low risk for urinary infections. The second uh, objective is obviously continence. That's devastating to patients to, for their quality of life to be able to go somewhere, not have to wear diapers, not have to worry about uh, being uh, in, incontinent and, and socially uh, um, uh, embarrassed. Uh, preservation of the upper tracts, I mentioned, is extremely important, and storage of urine, controlling the frequency uh, so that they don't feel like they have to live their lives around the toilet, so that they don't have to, when they go to a new place, do toilet mapping. They have to figure out where the bathrooms are before they go someplace new. So this is uh, how we approach the patient. These are our goals. So the first step is to try simple things. Lifestyle changes. Well, uh, I've been impressed that a lot of people take to heart that they have to drink a lot of water, a lot of fluids. Some people go a little, little overboard, I have to admit. So even though it's important to be well hydrated, especially living here in South Florida, uh, I have patients that are drinking more fluid than they really need. And so one of the easy things to do is to get them to restrict their fluids, especially after dinner. Because what bothers patients most, it seems, is the nighttime frequency. During the day, it's not such a big deal to get up and go to the bathroom. But during the nighttime, getting out of bed and interrupting their sleep uh, is, uh, and as Dr. Um, Steingo was saying, it's, it's very important, that, uh, the, the restorative properties of sleep, that they get rest. So sometimes we tell patients, look, just don't drink anything after dinner. Drink what you want during the day. Caffeine obviously has a, an effect on the bladder in two ways. One is caffeine is a diuretic. You literally make more urine as a result of the caffeine in the caffeinated beverages. But on top of that, caffeine is a stimulant. It stimulates the bladder. It makes the bladder more nervous, more anxious. Uh, there are some other things that are considered bladder irritants, particularly alcohol, spicy foods, uh, acidic foods, pickled foods. Um, some people are sensitive to things like tomatoes and tomato sauce. Uh, but you have to figure out what you are sensitive to. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that everybody has the same sensitivities. And I tell patients, just test themselves. 
Uh, weight loss will affect the, the bladder as well. Uh, pressure and on the bladder can, can make them more, uh, uh, urinate more frequently. What a lot of people don't appreciate is the bowel management affects the bladder. The bowel and the bladder live in the same neighborhood. So when the bowel doesn't work right, the bladder doesn't work right. They have to work in conjunction. And some patients have irritable bowel syndrome. Well, that's just the other side of the same coin as overactive bladder. So whatever it takes to keep their bowels regular, and, and that's a whole other subject, but it's not an unusual for me to talk to a patient who's having a lot of urinary symptoms, and I find out they're having a bowel movement once a week. Typically, we want them to have bowel movements at least every other day. They shouldn't allow themselves to get so impacted, their bowel so distended, because there's a reflex between a distended bowel and the bladder that, that affects the bladder. And sometimes they'll actually go into urinary retention, and we find out they're just impacted. They're, they're severely constipated. Uh, behavioral interventions. Well, uh, there are some bladder training. It's not necessarily uh, uh, easy, but bladder training, uh, the concept is, is that you try to delay the urge to go for, let's say, five minutes for the first week, and then the second week you'll try to delay the urge for 10 minutes, and you might be able to increase the bladder capacity that way. I don't encourage patients to do this unless they've been clearly evaluated by a urologist because we want to make sure you're not in retention, that you are emptying, and so on. So bladder training is usually done in conjunction with uh, my nurse or uh, I sometimes send patients for physical therapy and pelvic rehabilitation, but it shouldn't be attempted necessarily on your own. Uh, timed voiding. Uh, that's where you go by the clock. Uh, the, sense, the sense of urgency may not be reliable for some people, and what you have to do is you have to go by the clock. You'll figure out uh, what is an appropriate time frame that you don't uh, have an incontinent episode, uh, you don't let the bladder reach that maximum capacity where it's just too late, and uh, we do time voiding. That works particularly well in some of the elderly uh, or in patients that have difficulty in getting to the bathroom rapidly enough. If there's some uh, functional uh, uh, problem in getting there rapidly and getting undressed and getting to a commode or something, you got to make sure their time, their caregiver will, will time it so that they catch them before the accident. And then there's pelvic floor muscle training and exercises. And this is often done in conjunction with a, a very, I, I think it's very important to have a good qualified personnel for this, a, a physical therapist who specializes in pelvic rehabilitation or a nurse that understands it well. But it basically, they'll use things like biofeedback. You'll, you'll get some EKG pads put on your, on your pelvis, and you'll watch a computer screen. And you'll say, they'll say, OK, make that red line go up or make that blue line go down. And by practicing these exercises and learning which muscles to, to exercise, the patient goes home and does exercises at home on their own, and they come back in a week or two, and they get tested, and we look to see if the muscles are getting stronger. Are they improving? And it's remarkably effective. It's just, you know, it becomes a, a major uh, 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 production. But if patients are willing to do it, it will have a, a benefit. And uh, Kegel exercises are probably what people are most familiar with. But most patients, 50% at least, don't know what muscles to exercise. So what I tell patients who are trying to learn how to do Kegels is when you urinate, stop the stream. And that teaches you which muscles you're going to end up having to use to build up the, the strength of the pelvic floor to hold the urine in better. These uh, exercises uh, then should be done throughout the day. So it's hard to remember when to do these exercises. When you're driving and you come to a stop, do the exercises. When you're reading and you turn the page, do your exercises. When uh, you're watching television and a commercial comes on, do your exercises. So you would do these in 10 repetitions for 10 seconds each in, in, in a, in a, with 10 uh, uh, at least a day. Uh, so, uh, when we get down into some of the, the symptoms, so urgency, so fluid intake management, bladder training, um, decrease the caffeine or stimulants in the diet, uh, lose weight, pelvic floor muscle training, incontinence, uh, again, the caffeine is a stimulant and a diuretic, the weight loss, increased fiber to manage the bowel better, decreased constipation, pelvic floor muscle training again. 
Uh, and then frequency, fluid intake management uh, restrictions and reduce caffeine intake, reevaluate diuretic therapy if their patient is taking a diuretic and bladder training. So these are some of the conservative ways to manage. Now to help patients further with this, we have some new technology. One of them is called uh, percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. And quite simply what it is, it's a little like acupuncture needle that goes by your ankle. And the patient comes in once a week for 30 minutes and they get hooked up to this little electrical stimulator and they get a very low voltage electrical uh, uh, current to this nerve that runs from their ankle all the way up to their pelvis. And they do it once a week for 12 weeks, uh, 30 minutes a session. And by the end of the 12 weeks, they should notice some improvement. Uh, it doesn't hurt. They usually sit there and read or they watch television. Uh, and um, that's, uh, that's something that's relatively new and very minimally invasive to, uh, to teach, to train the nerves and, and build up the muscles and the nerves in the pelvis. Um, frequency, urgency. Okay, so we talked about uh, conservative things. Now we have to go a little bit further. We've got to use medications. There's a numerous, there's many, many medications on the market for overactive bladder. Uh, oxybutynin, which is ditropan, was the first one. But I'm sure many of you are familiar with these other ones. Vesicare, they're advertised fairly heavily on television. Uh, Tovias, Detro, Detrol, they were the ones that came out with gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Um, there's even patches now that you can buy over the counter. There's oxybutynin or detrol patches that can be purchased over the counter. They're very low dose and you put the patch on. I understand they're fairly expensive, but the patch is done, I think, twice a week. And this is the way we used to write the prescription for it, is that they use a patch twice a week that gets absorbed through the skin and it controls their bladder. The advantage of these patches, and there's a gel called Gelnique also that does that uh, without the, the patch. But the advantage of the ones through the skin is that the side effects of most of these medicines are not very well liked. The side effects tend to be dry mouth and constipation. And so the advantage of going through the skin is that you have less dry mouth and less constipation because it's actually uh, bypassing the GI tract. So um, there's some advantages to these uh, transdermal uh, 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 medications. Amipramine is an old-time medicine that we use in children that wet their bed, very inexpensive, and it has the advantage of also tightening the sphincter in addition to relaxing the bladder. Merbitrec, I, I bolded because it's the brand new one that's been out about a year. And Merbitrec is unique to this group of medications. It's not an anticholinergic like the rest of them. It's actually a beta, beta adrenergic. But the point is, is that it works with a different mechanism of action. So it doesn't have the same dry mouth and constipation associated with it. It has very little side effect. It can raise your blood pressure like three points or so, which is not significant, and nobody really ever notices that. So it's really uh, impressive how, how little side effect we see with the Merbitrec, and it is effective. So the big problem with it, of course, is that being a new medication, it tends to be expensive. It tends to be in the upper tiers of most of the insurance uh, companies, like tier three, and if you have a large copay for tier three, it's a problem. But I've been very impressed with this new medicine, and it, it's, complete, it's probably going to be the start of a whole new uh, group of medications. How many of you are familiar with Interstim? How many of you heard of Interstim? Anybody? Wow, okay. That's interesting. Okay, so Interstim is like the world's best kept secret. Um, it came out in the 1990s. I started around 1998 or so, and I think it, it was FDA approved 1997. But what Interstim is, it's actually almost like a, a bladder pacemaker. Uh, it's technically not a pacemaker, but it kind of works on that, on that principle. And what it is, is it's a little uh, battery-operated uh, device that gets implanted underneath the skin in the, in, the, in the upper buttock, and it stimulates the nerves that go to the bladder to get them to work better. And what's fascinating about Interstim, and, and at the meeting I just came from, they always have a, a big session on Interstim because it's also known as sacral modulation, but they always have a big session on it because 
it's unique. There's nothing else really like it. The closest that comes to it is that other thing I was telling you about where you put the little needle by the ankle, and that's going sort of retrograde. That's going backwards. This one is going forward, and it's much more effective. So the interstim is done in two stages. The first stage is done in the office where we have you lie down. We numb up your back with a little bit of Novocaine, and we pass this little wire through the lower part of the back. And you have to wear something like a, like a, a pager or a uh, cell phone for about uh, a week to find out if it works. And then after that week, if it does work, if you have at least 50% improvement, we could put the implant in, the permanent implant in. And it works at both, both ends of the spectrum. It works at the end of the patients that are going too frequently, that are not responsive to medications. And it works at the other end of the spectrum where the patients are not urinating frequently enough and they have a weak bladder. So it's a very interesting thing. Botox, obviously you know how Botox works. It paralyzes muscle, it relaxes muscle. That's why they use it for wrinkles. If a patient has a very overactive bladder that's not responding, we can use Botox. I got the signal that I got to move forward. Okay. Uh, for incontinence, if, the, if it's a female and her sphincter is not strong, in other words, if she leaks with coughing, sneezing, laughing, lifting, straining, bearing down, jumping, or running, it means that the sphincter valve is not tight, it's not strong, and if it's loose, uh, sometimes from childbearing or for whatever reasons, it's loose, it lets go, and the, and the urine literally falls out. It's not the bladder pushing, it's just the sphincter has lost its support. Very simple to fix these. We put a little sling in. I know you see those things on television that slings are bad. They're not bad. They, there's just lawyers out there that are trying to make a buck, and I, and, and, and I understand, but the slings are, are very effective. They don't have complications. I've been doing them for many, many years without a complication. And they stop the urine leak that comes with coughing, sneezing, laughing, lifting, straining, bearing down, jumping, or running. So it's not for everybody, but it does work well. For patients that want to avoid the surgery, there's a simple thing where we just inject some bulking agent around their sphincter. And that's like adding a washer to a leaky faucet. And it's, it lasts several years. It's not as permanent as a sling, but it's effective for at least a few years. Uh, okay, underactive bladder. So how do we help the patient that doesn't have uh, ability to contract very well? Well, we use sometimes something called alpha blockers, and most men are familiar with alpha blockers because there's Flomax, there's Uroxitrol, there's Rapaflow, Hytrin, Cardura, Terazosin. These are medications that relax the bladder outlet and let the urine out easier. And we use these in females too. And I've been doing it for years and I wasn't quite sure if it helped, but I just came from the meeting and I was talking to a, a urologist who specializes in MS out in Michigan. And he says, oh yeah, about 17% of my patients, my female patients use alpha blockers. <clears throat> Intermittent catheterization, uh, that's where you learn how to self-cath or you have a caregiver that catheterizes. Uh, indwelling catheters are ultimately sort of the last resort. Uh, we use that in, in, in cases, uh, if they have to be in for a long time, we put the catheter directly in above through the skin at the suprapubic level. And that way they have less problems. So this is indwelling catheter. This is a, shows you how small the self-catheter is for females. It's the size of a lipstick. Women have learned to do this. It's like brushing their teeth. It takes them a minute, and they're quick at it. It can be done by uh, very simply. They only have to wash their hands. It doesn't have to be sterile. Uh, other issues, uh, recurrent urinary tract infection. I'm sorry, I won't be able to talk to you about that. I think that's an interesting way to prevent those. Um, and um, there's problems with the chronic catheters. This shows you how different centers will manage patients. There's a lot of of, of there's no set rule on how to manage these patients. Everything has to be tailored to the individual. This just gives you an idea that uh, different centers have different treatment options and use different uh, uh, ways of managing incontinence and overactive bladder for MS patients. Okay, so this is the thing that I wanted to show you. I don't know if this, this is not gonna read very well, I'm afraid. Um, this is, I took this picture just about uh, a couple hours ago. This is called the Actionable MS Urinary Function Screening Test. And apparently this is a questionnaire that they pass out at some of the MS centers up in uh, Michigan and up in New York. Uh, and they found this to be a useful tool. So I'm just going to ask the people to consider these questions. There, you have either none of the time, some of the time, most of the time, or all of the time. So the first question is, during the day, how often do you feel that you had to urinate right away? Two, how often have you had urinary accidents or leakage? 
Three, during the day, how strong was the feeling that you needed to urinate right away? Four, on a typical night, how often do you have to wake up in the night to urinate? Five, on a typical day, how many times did you urinate? Then for the following questions, please put a check below responses which best describes impacts from the bladder symptoms you may have experienced recently. Again, not at all, a little, moderate, or extreme. How much have you, your activities with friends and family been limited by your bladder problems? How embarrassed have you been because of your bladder symptoms? How much has your ability to work, paid or volunteer, outside the home been limited by your bladder problems? And when you do this, you add up the, ooh, shoot. When you do this, you add up the numbers, and if the number comes up to greater than three, if the number comes up greater than three, you're supposed to see a urologist. So, you know, they've done some studies using this questionnaire, and they were, they were surprised at how few MS patients are getting referred to urologists. And, you know, we actually can help. So it's important that uh, you be aware that we're out there to assist you. Thank you very much. So now we're going to do the Q&A portion of this. When you hold this, don't hold there. That's a transmitter. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. So does anybody have questions? I know I would ask the one that he said he doesn't have time to talk about. <laughs> Which one is that? I don't remember. Oh, okay. I have MS. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody have a question? Thank you. We'll start there. <laughs> Make it the long way. Yes. Oh. The, the thing that you were talking about, um, the injection that you referred to, like putting a washer, is that done in the office? Uh, the question is, has to do with the, the bulking agent, the transurethral bulking agent. Uh, technically, it can be done in the office. Personally, I wouldn't want it done to me in the office. Uh, it's, it's a sensitive area to inject. So what we do is we take the patient to an outpatient surgery center and it takes me about five minutes. They don't have to go to sleep completely. They get the kind of the twilight that you would get for a colonoscopy. They just kind of make you feel happy and then I go in and do zip, zip, zip and I'm done. So it's really not a big deal at all. But I, I, I technically it's designed to be an office procedure. I just hate torturing people. Yeah, my question is about uh, which is the best um, medication for UTIs. Unfortunately, Ampara and Tysabri, they both cause UTIs. And in my case, they went and they did uh, testing and I was resistant to Cipro, resistant to um, several of the, uh, so, how do you know which is the best one to use? Because as you said, the risk of uh, ruining my kidneys are really high. So this is the question that I said I don't have time to talk about. <laughs> so thank you. Um, you know, um, recurrent urinary tract infection doesn't just affect MS patients. We have a number, of, especially females, who have recurrent UTI. And, and the truth is, uh, first of all, you have to take into consideration not every urinary infection has to be treated. Some people can live with bacteria, meaning there's bacteria in the urine, they're colonized, and as long as they're not getting ill, as long as they're not showing any problems, they get develop sort of a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria. And so that's first of all. I mean, we, we, some doctors think all urine has to be sterile. It doesn't always have to be sterile. Uh, your, your bowel certain isn't sterile, isn't sterile and you survive that. So uh, the bottom line is, yes, we want to keep the bacteria count low. We want to keep it in control. We want a, a, a particular, we want a bacteria that is not particularly bad for you. Uh, and so you develop resistance to Cipro, which is a real common problem here in South Florida. Cipro is a, well, used to be a no-brainer. We could use Cipro, and we always knew it was going to work because it was the most powerful oral antibiotic we had. Well, over the years, we've overused it, and now the bacteria are smarter than us, and they eat Cipro for lunch. So we can't use Cipro as much as we'd like. There are still other oral antibiotics, and if you still use the oral antibiotics and suppress the bacteria, that'll help too. Now, getting back to how to manage patients with recurrent UTI, 
I'm going to just run through this quickly. So I think there's a number of things that you can do to avoid infection or keep the bacteria at a low enough level that it doesn't bother you. Number one, take extra vitamin C, 1,000 milligrams twice a day. The vitamin C is ascorbic acid. It's a water-soluble vitamin. It passes through you very quickly into the urine. You don't want the time release. You don't want rose hips. You don't want anything fancy. You want the cheapest generic vitamin C you can find because the good ones are designed to stay in your body. We don't want that. We want it in the urine. So you take something really inexpensive. It goes right through you like, anyway, it goes right through you into the urine, and then it makes the urine acidic because it's ascorbic acid. The bacteria don't like acidic urine. And it's very, very safe. It can't hurt you, too. Cranberries do work, and people drink cranberry juice, but there's not a lot of cranberry in cranberry juice. So don't bother with the cranberry juice because you have to drink about 20 gallons take cranberry capsules. They simply take the cranberry fruit, they freeze dry it, they crush it in a powder, they put it in a capsule. You'll find it in every drug store, every health food store, and they try to put vitamin C in there, they never put enough. So you need to overdose on the vitamin C in order to make the urine acidic. And you have to dose yourself at least twice a day. So you might as well take the cranberry and the vitamin C together twice a day, at least, minimum. And that will help prevent the, back, the infection to begin with. Uh, you could also take some probiotics, particularly the ones that have lactobacillus. Uh, in the female, the lactobacillus lives in the vagina, and it, lactobacillus bacteria make lactic acid. Lactic acid makes the vagina a little bit acidic. That also protects the outside of the uh, bladder from getting colonized with the bad bacteria. Lactobacillus doesn't cause urinary infections. E. coli does. Enterococcus does. Klebsiella does. Uh, you know, Pseudomonas does. Enterobacter. But, Kleb, but the lactobacillus doesn't cause urinary infections, so that works mostly in the vagina. Most of the probiotics are acidophilus. That's good for the GI tract, but you want to try to find one that has lactobacillus. Uh, and then, of course, there's the simple things, knowing how to wipe. You always wipe from front to back. Uh, you have to sit down to void. Some women tend to hover over public toilets. They're afraid of touching the toilet, that they're going to get venereal disease. So. You won't get any illnesses from sitting on a toilet. I understand the women's bathrooms, the toilets are disgusting, I understand, but you're better off sitting than you are hovering because you don't empty well. If you spend all your energy and muscles trying to hover over the toilet, you're not relaxing the pelvic floor again to let the urine out and you're fighting yourself. Uh, finally, one of the other things I use quite often to prevent uh, serious infections is a medication called methanamine. Methanamine is an old-time medicine that was, des was uh, invented or developed before they had antibiotics, before penicillin, before sulfa, we had methanamine. And methanamine is an antiseptic for the urine. It's not an antibiotic. It's like soap and water. And therefore, you don't get resistance to it the way you do antibiotics. You don't get resistance to soap and water. So therefore, it keeps the urine clean. It doesn't kill the bacteria completely. It suppresses the number of bacteria, keeps it under control, and you just stay on it and you prevent the infections. But you have to stay on it typically. Any other questions? By the way, before you overdose on vitamin C, speak with your neurologist because vitamin C amps our immune systems and we don't need that. I'm speaking from a very specific I, 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 point of a, view. And I'm not a doctor, which is why I said speak with your neurologist first before you just you know, take too much vitamin C and cause yourselves other problems. Okay? All right. Next. There we go. Other side of the This is a very convoluted question because I really don't understand how this all works. When we you think have I do? <laughs> I would I would hope so. <laughs> when we go when we have problems with with what you're talking about, uh, emptying the bladder and relaxing the sphincter, making the sphincter work, and they have to work in conjunction together. We're talking about muscles, are we not? Yes. Okay. But a lot of them are involuntary. So, not all of them are voluntary muscles. Okay, so, so now... So we, we control the ones we can, and we can't control those that we can't. Okay. So now we're, we're dealing with a neurological disease that's now... That's now triggering the muscles to work correctly. Is that, is that what, what we're after? Is that, what ha is that the problem, what's happening? Our nerves are not giving the right uh, conduction, so, so that's why the, the bladder and the sphincter it, it, don't work correctly? It, it, it's much more complicated than I, I, I understand it. So 
the bottom line is, is there's, there's a very sophisticated uh, reflexes and, and, and nerve uh, uh, functioning between those muscles that are voluntary and those muscles that are involuntary. For example, the process of urination means that when you go to, to empty your bladder, the first step is you actually relax your pelvic floor. That's the first step, the pelvic floor relaxes. Then automatically, the bladder then kicks in and pushes the urine out. You can't squeeze the, the bladder muscle itself. You can't cause that bladder muscle to squeeze voluntarily. You have to rely on it to kick in automatically. So there's all kinds of reflexes here. And then again, I was mentioning the coordination between the pelvic floor muscles and the, and the, and the external sphincter also is involuntary. You can control the muscles around the sphincter, but the sphincter itself is an involuntary muscle. So we're not even sure what's the triggers for some of these, and their relationship to each other is very complex. So what can the medicines, if you take med uh, you know, uh, pills and that, what, are they, what is it trying to do? What does it help well, to do? Well, each medicine is designed for specific things. The, the medicines that are designed to relax the bladder muscle help you to store better. The medicines that relax the sphincter help you to empty better. But isn't that going to be a conflict with your, your nerves? Or is that going to override? No, the nerves are your problem. Isn't that why you're coming right, to see me in the first right. place? Yeah, but I'm just saying, is that, that's why I'm saying this is a convoluted question. We're trying I, to help you. I understand that. <laughs> At least I hope so. Uh, what, what I don't understand is, is how are we helping the, the nerves? I don't know. I think we're trying to override the muscle and the nerves, right? I mean, you're trying to, I don't, I don't know how that would work. Okay. I really don't. Maybe I don't we could understand. take this, uh, after this after the meeting. If I were allowed to throw it, I would throw it to you. But maybe that can help her a little. Um, maybe this can help the lady a little bit. I had, um, when I had an exacerbation in 09, uh, half of my body was paralyzed. And because of that is I do retain a lot of uh, urine. And that causes the UTI additional to the uh, Ampara and the other. Hopefully, with the medication that he was describing, that will help me empty completely, and that will be better than catheterizing myself. And is it correct if I'm if I heard and today that you can retrain yourself with physical therapy? You can hopefully retrain your body to to empty completely. There is. Uh, so there is a, a certain amount of retraining that is available, yes. I mean, it, it depends on the individual, it depends on their, their medical issues, and, uh, but there's absolutely there's retraining involved, and that's where the physical therapists who are knowledgeable in this area are very, very useful. And that's where we do the, you know, we put the EKG pads, which are measuring the muscle activity on you, and then we can tell what's going on, and so you learn because it's very hard, even though it's your body, it's hard for you to understand what muscles are, are not working properly or which ones you have to exercise. It's, it's non-intuitive. It's really, these are not muscles that people are familiar with. For instance, the Kegel exercises, it's not the abdominal muscles, it's not the thigh muscles, it's not the buttock muscles, it's the muscles in between. Any other questions in the back of the room? My feet are starting to hurt. I, I could walk over here if you like. Uh, that would be nice, okay. thank you. Yes. What's the life expectancy of a sling? Uh, the life, <laughs> it, it, it's <laughs> the lifetime of the patient, I would imagine. <laughs> it, it's pretty much a lifetime guarantee. I mean, most, these slings are, uh, I remember the days before the slings were developed, and, and thank God for the slings. The slings are, are, have changed the way we manage uh, incontinence for, for females. The slings are pretty much a lifetime they're stronger than any of your tissues. A thousand years from now, when you and I are dust, that sling will still be here. <laughs> yes, it, it does. It does change patients' lives. It really does change lives. You held off on that, didn't you? Just wait. My understanding is that uh, most of us women have uh, suffered from um, urinary tract infections, right? 
most most of the women. It's basically more more women than men. Women are more prone towards urinary tract infection okay, than men. So They're actually allowed to have up to two or three a year. We consider it kind of normal. But I, I'm also thinking logically here. We women, when we go to, the, like you were talking about public bathrooms, we don't sit. We don't sit. And then basically, we urinate. Uh, you don't sit. My patients sit. But, no. <laughs> but honestly, honestly, you know, we know that. They probably lie to me. So I think, so. I think uh, we, we are holding, we, we are holding the, the urine in the bladder, and that is causing infections. Right? Right. Am I wrong? Absolutely. You know, I, I, I want my patients to sit. I, I, I tell them that, and they give me a look like I must be crazy. They look at me like I'm from another planet. So. Anybody else? With that, I want to thank yeah, one, the one more. Oh, wait. I one more question. Again. I've heard that if you... I know that you're saying sit, but if you lean forward, that a lot of people say that the bladder it empties it more. Is that true? To help void it? Uh, what you're doing, when you do, when you lean forward to try to empty more, what you're doing is a maneuver called a crede, C-R-E-D-E. -E. It's a French word. Um, and it, some patients will actually use their hand and push on their bladder uh, while they do it. They'll make either a fist and they'll ball up their fists and push down and try to push more urine out. What you're doing is, if that's when you have a bladder that's a underactive bladder, and you're trying to get more urine out, if you have a weak bladder, uh, the muscle I'm talking about, then you're creating more pressure by using your abdominal muscles or using your hands to push the urine out. Patients will do that when it's appropriate, but not, it's not for everybody, because if your problem, again, is because of a bladder outlet obstruction or the sphincter, a functional obstruction, the sphincter's not relaxing, you end up doing more harm than good in the long run. Well, leaning forward is just creating more pressure by, you know, you're, you're not doing anything physiologic other than creating pressure by kind of folding your, your muscles on top of each other. One more. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Stavowitz, is there medication I can take to help empty my bladder? Yes. What is it? Depends. <laughs> well, you know, it depends on, on, on the problem, of course. The most common one for a male, I would guess, and if I was just to say what is the most likely, would be Flomax. Flomax. Okay. Most I'm common sure one would be I've Flomax or equivalent, you know. And, and what that does is it relaxes the bladder outlet more when it's time to void. Wait. It's not recorded. Oh, sorry. Um, what was my question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You could speak to me afterward. I'll be around for a little bit. Sorry. That's all right. He lost a train of thought. It's okay. We all do that. Even without MS, we do that. No, you're over 50, you're going to forget. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? And again, thank you, Dr. Samowitz, thank for you. coming down. So up on the screen right now, what I said earlier was a place where you can find the different uh, things like the, 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 the programs that we have on YouTube or Blog Talk Radio. So if you use the website and you just go to that right there at the top where it says blogs and video, just let it open up and then you'll find where to connect to to go to the YouTube channel to watch all the different programs. We've been video recording these programs now since last August on and off, but more so this year we started doing it like at every one of our large programs. Our smaller programs were not, but all the large programs, yes. All right, and we've had, um, we had a, uh, an attorney recently speak about caregiver rights, all right? And that discusses everything with um, power of attorney, financial things and whatnot. You sh it is very important for you all to hear what goes on. Do not sign a power of attorney unless you have an attorney with you making sure that you're not giving away your entire life. But again, you can go there and you can listen to that program. We have neurologists, many different neurologists talking about different subjects. And even if it is the same subject, you may hear something different among the different neurologists that might answer something that you've been waiting to hear. So before we get into the raffles, Carrie is going around the room and she's picking up the seminar evaluations. We would appreciate you filling that out simply because you may have something on there that may help us to know of something different to do in the future. 
And by the way, in the fall, we'll be doing in Miami another MS Symposium, which the last one we did, we had a grand total in attendance of about 223 people. And online, because we did it as a presentation, we did it as a live webcast, and I think we had about 220 there too. So our day's audience was over 400 people, which thumbs up. We conclude another program, and we do thank you all for coming out again. These programs couldn't happen unless you were here, and I want to thank you all for coming and helping us out.